The New Jerusalem comes down out oh, of heaven. Right, right. God, God, and this is sometimes hard to understand. In some ways, it seems like He completely obliterates the current heavens and the earth, and then in some ways, it seems like there's a refashioning. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever it is, it, He's He's going to like you take a towel and you remove the water. He's going to remove sin because what we're seeing in the Bible, sin has a literal effect even in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So he's going to wipe all that away, but what he created was good. Mm -hmm. So it's refashioned or renewed, so it comes down out of heaven and it replaces the current Jerusalem. That's really his ultimate home, if you will. And yet, every you know, Virginia is going to be Virginia, but it's going to be even more spectacular than it already is, without pollution, without crime, without any of those things, and we are going to have bodies. So Jesus is always the example in that um, he said, put your hand on my side. Look at, go ahead and touch my hand. You can see I'm not a spirit. I'm just like you, but in the resurrection, he has a, a superior quality. That's why we call it a spiritual body. So we live in natural bodies which are limited. Then we will live in spiritual bodies which can move freely between the, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven and back up into heaven, which is where, like we die this very second, we go straight to being in heaven. It is a place just like this because Hebrews says that this is a pattern. So this just reflects what's in heaven, albeit without a, a tinge of sin. So there are animals, there are plants, there are rivers, there are streams, there's all these things, but the sights, the smells, the sounds, we can't comprehend, we can't comprehend it because we are so dulled by sin. So blues to us may look nice, but blues in heaven are, are beyond description. That's why John is always saying it's like, it's like this, it's like that, it's like this, Ezekiel. It's like this, it's like that. Because what I saw is so superior to earth, so the only thing I can do is say to you, well, Henry, it's like this. It's blue like this, but there's no word to describe the blue that I see. It's interesting because there, there was a story that was out years ago of a, of a kid who went to, died on the operating table, went to heaven. And the way he described it is he was like, he was on a playground where kids were playing, but he talked about the colors the colors being indescribably different, like they were almost alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but but the, the the real profound part of it is he was just a kid playing on the playground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Jesus was there. So a lot of it's over our heads, but it's real. Mm -hmm. And and we think this is real, but that's just kind of ethereal. It's like eh, I don't really know. We are so so deceived. This is real, but that's more real. That real gives definition to this real. Well, I'll tell you, you know, um, God, you know, one of my founding scriptures is right in the beginning. God tells us where he's from, where he is. It says, in the beginning of time, God created the heavens of space and matter. That's the earth. Mm -hmm. So he's telling us he's outside of time, space, and matter. Just yes. like someone that built a computer is outside of the computer. And uh, he talks... You know, I used to follow, I like physics and science, so I don't follow, you know, I'm sure some of us know about Stephen Hawking, and you know, some mm -hmm. of them, he's now passed, but he was atheist, but not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, he, uh, he, 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 top physicists will tell you, there's, we're, we're only in three dimensions ourselves, you know, we're, we're you know, God, there's, they're subject, uh, proposing there's like 11 different dimensions, where, wow. you know, that we don't, we can't see the other dimensions. Right. God's outside of all of those. So when you understand who He is, you appreciate Him and His Word a lot more. My other, my other uh, 
scripture was uh, Numbers 20, uh, 23, 19, where God said you cannot lie. So just those two things. God sees the beginning and the end. sees the whole life. He cannot lie to us. And the more you read about him, the more you find his love, the more you have faith in him and, and have confidence that, you know, he's not going to steer you wrong, you know. And that's why I tell, he mentioned my, other, my main foundation, founding uh, scripture was Psalm 1, 1, or Psalm 1. Yeah. And that kind of lays it out, gives us instructions who, who to hang around with, who not to hang around <laughs> you know, what to medita- meditate on. And throughout the song, you know, I was reading, I've been reading songs too, so I'm almost done with that. But yeah, that's good to go over every now and then because throughout there, David talks about meditating on God's word and day and night and how, you know, it makes him wiser than his enemies, you know, and you know, just protect him. You know, but yeah. I tell people all the time if you want to start reading the Bible, just get up every day and read a psalm. And read a proverb, and that's it. Yeah. Just do that. Just do that. Yeah. You'll fall in love with Jesus if you just do yeah. that. You'll be so. You'll become like a, I want to know more. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah, it's. I was reading Ezekiel last night, and these creatures, the the, the cherubim that he describes, are four faces. Yeah, yeah. But as they turn, the faces don't turn. Yeah. They remain straight. Mm-hmm. That's the dimension that. Mm-hmm. Because back then they were, how could that be? But now, with here's a benefit of science that I think they understood it, though they may not have been able to articulate it scientifically. But now we, with with the help of science, we understand there's a different dimension. Now we can look back and say, okay, I I can see that. Or when Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that was before space age travel. So you can break the Earth's barrier. But you have to have a spacesuit. Or even Isaiah, when he he refers to the sphericity of the earth. He mm-hmm. says the circle mm-hmm. of the earth. But the Hebrew word is sphere. Mm-hmm. Well, we know that the earth is not a literal circle. It's a sphere. Yeah. But he uses a Hebrew word for, it's called, it's it's a word, sphericity. What, so what, what, what is that? Because I, I got a daughter who's going to flat earth phase right now. Uh-oh. Oh, no. She's an attorney. <laughs> And she's a die-hard Bible thumper. Yeah. Because the one verse says the earth is a footstool. Bad footstools aren't round, they're flat. No. Oh. Yeah, but stop, 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 please. Come on. So, so where does it refer to? What, 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 what scripture was that? Is that referred to the earth? Isaiah 43, I think. 43, 43. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's right the around there. Um, footstool. See, you know, that's where you get into interpretation issues. You have to allow for yeah, scripture exactly. to use mm-hmm. metaphor and symbols and you don't interpret metaphors or symbols in a wooden literal literalistic fashion you interpret the you interpret the word of god literally but not necessarily literalistically there's a difference so all right let me move on uh, i feel like i'm finally making some note page progress uh, now we're in genesis uh, the God who creates and plans redemption. Uh, the title, uh, so we're at the bottom of page eight. The title of our English book for this book comes from the Greek word birth, recognizing that Genesis explains where all that exists was birth from. A Genesis, it's a birthing, it's a new beginning. That's what Genesis is. Um, moreover, the nation, uh, so it tells us where man comes from, men and women. Uh, moreover, the nation of Israel was birthed from God through one man, Abraham. And uh, paragraph number one in your notes, it will be vital for us to keep in mind the historical context in which Moses wrote Genesis, particularly the Mesopotamian literature of the ancient Near East. Mesopotamia is where Abraham came from. It's modern day Iraq and Iran and Syria as well. So that literature of the ancient Near East demonstrates to us the vast differences between the entrenched, widespread polytheism of that culture, that is many gods, compared to the biblical literature. So here's a long quote. Its gods were personifications of natural forces, and they know no moral principles. No moral principle. So the gods were not concerned 
about morality. No moral principle. So this is where the Bible comes from. It comes from a, a ethos, a way of viewing the world where they were not concerned about morality. They lie, they steal, they fornicate, and they kill. Even the New Testament. So you have Zeus and Aphrodite and, and um, Apollos. They're all, none of them are concerned about morality. Now, mankind enjoys no special role. No special role. So what we're doing is we are going back in time right now. We're, we're in that time capsule or whatever. We're jumping back 3,000 years. And so I talked to my neighbor, Gwen, who's a pagan worshiper, and the topic of morality of the gods she worships never comes up. I talked to Marcus, my neighbor, about uh, the gods he worships. The topic of morality, holiness, love, never comes up. Serving, honoring, just not, we, we don't have even a frame of reference that way. And yet, we're created moral beings. So something is askew in us, and we're longing for something, right? It was Blaise Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that only God himself can fulfill. So they're groping, they're looking, but they don't have any answers. It wasn't that way in the beginning, but as they stray from God, this is where they go. They start worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, and they come up with deities for their, for their crops, for their fertility, uh, for all these things. So mankind enjoys no special role as the highest created earthly being, made in the creator's image. That's Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Man is rather the lowly servant of his divine overlords made to provide them. Provide them. So you exist for an invisible God and your sole purpose in life is to bring them food that they don't eat. So you set it before them, a statue, and it just sits there, so someone else has to come and take it away out there it rots. That's just, but yet that still happens today, right? With, with uh, Buddhists, uh, they, they set food, fruit before a statue, and then they have to go and take that food away. Carved by hand. And they, and they made the statue. So that is what happened back in, New, in Old Testament times and New Testament times. In absolute contrast, the biblical narratives present one mm -hmm. true, all-holy, and omnipotent God who as creator, and this is why creation is so important, creation is not just about what we see, it's about who stands behind creation. It really comes down to an authority. So evolution and creation is not only about what exists, it's about who stands above what exists. That ultimately, I'm convinced, is the crux of the evolution creation debate. Because if you understand there's a creator, then you, now you know you're responsible for that creator. And there are many, many writings of evolutionists who actually admit, I believe in evolution because I don't want to submit to a creator. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually admit the moral reason for why they believe in evolution. And many others won't admit that, but you have enough that will admit it. That, that gives us credence for it. So the creator stands prior to and independent of the world, which is what Henry was saying. He's supranatural, not just supernatural, he is supra. He goes beyond the natural world. But he speaks and the elements come into being. But why does he speak? He does it for man. Who does he create for? He creates for, well, we should say he creates for his glory, but he gives it to man. He creates for man's benefit. He gives him the trees, the fruit, all of these things. He provides for them. His work is good, harmonious, and whole. It's not a chaotic environment. There's seasons. Everything has order. Everything that we see has order. Man can come then to depend upon, all right, this is, this is planting season. This is harvest season. 
We don't pay attention to that, but boy, they sure pay attention to it in Uganda. They, they, this, I hear, there's two seasons, planting and harvesting. So you don't, we don't do conferences for pastors during planting season or harvesting season. They have to come. They have to be attending to their farms. We're, we're not familiar with that, but they can depend upon that because there's order. Although the human family rebels, God tempers his judgment with mercy, supporting and maintaining them with grace and forbearance. You see why I put that long quote in there? It's a good one. Mm -hmm. Paragraph number two, another significant difference between the God of the Bible and other pagan deities, in this case, the Canaanite gods, is that Elohim is personal. He is a personal God. He is personal. While the Cana Canaanite gods were primarily associated with places. Places. So Baal usually inhabited a certain area of the land of Israel. He wasn't on, on, um, on uh, omnipresent. Omnipresent, thank you. Yeah. So he wasn't omnipresent. He was, he was um, specifically located in one area. What was that area that was the area which is Caesarea Philippi today. That's the area where uh, you have Mount Hermon. You have Mount Hermon and the water comes down, I mentioned earlier, comes down from Mount Hermon through this particular area and it irrigates all of the Hula Valley, which is most the richest agricultural area in the land of Israel. So when the Israelites deceived themselves, forsook Yahweh and went after the Baals, it was because they wanted their crops blessed. That's that was what that was all about. Then they would harvest their crops and they would sell them to the people down in um, around the, the Sea of Galilee, which is which is below sea level. They would sell the crops over into the people in Jerusalem. That was their really their breadbasket. Still is, in a sense. But they began to see that it was Baal who gave them their crops and not Yahweh. Paragraph three will also be helpful to note at the outset four major theological themes in Genesis, which um, uh, Lesore, Hubbard, and Bush point out often recur continuously in Genesis. First, the nature and implications of the fact that God is creator. That is very, very clear at the outset. But you have got a, an emphasis on God as creator throughout the Old Testament. You see it everywhere in the Psalms. You see it everywhere throughout the Old Testament because when they're referring to him as creator, they're not just saying be appreciative for what you see. What they're saying is he is the creator and no other God. Therefore, he is the one that has authority. So uh, paragraph three is creator. And paragraph number four, the second important theme is the radical seriousness of sin. The seriousness with which God takes sin because serious -ness. Ness, yes. seriousness of sin. That's another major theme in Genesis. Why is that important? Because he's dealing with a society that doesn't take sin seriously. And so if you don't understand the holiness of God, you're not going to take him seriously either. And you'll remain the same. So God's trying to lift people out of their self-deception and set them free. What does Jesus say? If you abide in my word and my words abide in you, you will know the truth, and the truth shall continually make you free. That's God's plan from the, from the very beginning. Um, so the second important theme is the radical seriousness of sin. The third, the way in which God's judgment meets human sin at each point. His judgment meets human sin at every point. He doesn't excuse it but he provides a redemption for it. And the fourth 
major theological theme in Genesis is the presence, nonetheless, and almost surprisingly, of his preserving, sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. His preserving, sustaining grace. I'm thinking about um, Jacob, the manipulator, the conniver, who's always disobeying God. He's, he's always getting himself in trouble. He's a conniver. He's a manipulator. But God still has sustaining grace for Jacob. And then in Jacob's later life, Jacob really comes to, to know God and to serve him. Um, so you see that in, in Jacob's offspring and Isaac's offspring. They do some pretty rotten things, but God has sustaining grace. Speaking of his grace, we find a candid portrayal of his people as sinners and as failures. Abraham, the great man of faith, has times of faith failures. Noah is a righteous man, but he's disobedient to God. Though he's, yeah, though he's described in the New Testament as a righteous man, Lot is often found to be greedy and selfish. What blows me away is right, Lot is called a righteous man. In Hebrews 11, and unless I'm missing something, I've not seen anything in Genesis where he's righteous. So that shows me God's sustaining grace, that he doesn't write us off for our faith failures. He looks at our overall life. Rebecca and Jacob are deceptive and manipulative. Mm -hmm. Joseph's brothers are vindictive and treacherous, and yet they're redeemed at the end. Isn't it interesting that Genesis starts off with a focus on God's goodness? And then at the very end, Genesis 50, verse 20 says what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Good is the focus at the beginning. Good is the focus at the end. God could have wiped you out because he told me this was going to happen. I tried to tell you. You didn't listen to me. I paid a heavy price for it. You gave me up for dead. I've been in prison in Egypt. And it's all because of you dudes. Because you're so jealous. And yet... God had changed him to such an extent that instead of being vindictive against his brothers, he broke down in loud weeping, so loud that the Egyptians heard what was going on. And then he revealed himself and he brought redemption. So many people often say that Joseph is, is a type of Christ. Um, the author of Genesis is Moses. Name of the book, in Hebrew, Bereshit, uh, which means beginning. Same thing for the Greek word Genesis, which is taken from the Septuagint, abbreviated as the LXX, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now you're thinking, wait a minute. This, I'm just getting down to the point where I, all right, I get it. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But what happened is about 200 years before Christ, you had a large contingent of Jewish people living in Alexandria, Egypt, which is the northern part of Egypt. As happens with most second-generation people, they don't speak the language of their parents. By that time, the whole Middle East had been um, Hellenized. Um, Hellene is, is the Greek word for Greek by Alexander the Great. So he had conquered the entire Middle East and he enforced Greek customs and language. So in Alexandria, Egypt, you have a large population of Jews living there that stopped speaking Hebrew and they're only speaking Greek. Scholars, 72 of them, got together and said, we gotta do something about this because our people are, are illiterate when it comes to Hebrew. We have to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. So that's what they did. It's called the Septuagint or um, abbreviated as LXX. Instead of 72, they just uh, abbreviated it as LXX. Most of the New Testament, when it quotes the Old Testament, it's quoting the Septuagint, not the Hebrew mm -hmm. language. Not, not only, but in many ways, it, it goes back and forth and quotes the Greek New Testament, I mean, Old Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. So, so you'll see that every now and then. You'll see that LXX, now you know what that means. Hopefully it won't confuse you. It's just a translation and done for very practical uh, purposes. The theme and purpose is to reveal God's nature, 
his purpose and his plan for humanity. His nature. What does Genesis do? It takes a God who stands outside of time and space, who creates men and women in his image according to his likeness, and he doesn't leave them without a knowledge of himself. So it's his nature. In Kenya, they love to say God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and that is his nature. They have that little kind of British, we love it, we say nature. But they laugh, and we had a lot of fun with them. So they, they, they laugh at our accent. So he reveals his nature, he reveals his purpose and his plan for humanity. He doesn't, he doesn't leave man without knowledge of him and what he wants for man. So there's something called general revelation. This is important. There's general revelation. What is the general revelation? Well, Psalm 19, the first part of Psalm 19 answers that. I'm going to turn there. Psalm 19 gives us the idea of general, general revelation. So does Romans 1. Um, so you have in Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. So it, it, the Hebrew word means to recount. Um, it can even mean to celebrate. But it speaks. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. So we look up into the heavens, you see sunrises, sunsets, cloud formations, rainbows, etc. And God uses that to say there is someone superior to you. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. And yet there's no speech nor are there words. And yet it's communicated. Day to day, um, all creation is communicating to us order, design, purpose, plan. Um, there is no speech, verse 3, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. And yet, their line, their measuring tape has gone out throughout all the earth. Their utterances to the end of the world. So it doesn't speak, but it does speak by its design. <clears throat> In them, he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. So David is saying that is general revelation. People can see that there's a creator based upon what they observe. Then David moves from general revelation to special revelation. That's beginning in verse 7. Did you have something? I have a question. But it's like going on, I'm looking on in Psalm 19, where it says the law of the Lord is perfect. Is that law there? Is that the Hebrew Torah? Torah. Okay. Yeah, every time you see law, that's the Hebrew word Torah. Okay. There's no other word for it. Okay. So yeah, so there you go. The, the Torah of Yahweh. So you notice I'm saying Yahweh in place of capital L-O-R-D. What is Yahweh? Personal active covenant keeping. The Torah of Yahweh is perfect. So already he's saying that it's, that it's perfect. But what does it do? It has a practical result. It restores the soul. You want your soul restored? Get into the word of God. The testimony, which is just a synonym of Yahweh, is sure, makes wise the simple or inexperienced. The precepts of Yahweh are right. What do they do? They rejoice the heart. So the reason why they rejoice the heart is because they're reliable, they're true, they're right. We can count on them. That, that removes uncertainty because it's perfect. You see what God's plan is with this word. It's not just theoretical, but that's why he emphasizes his truth so often. And his righteousness is to give us stability. We're sure about our faith. 
The commandment of the Lord is pure, but notice that it has a practical effect. It enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous and altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Nothing in the New Testament like quite like this. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Right? Nothing in the New Testament even remotely like this. Like this. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. You would expect him to say, your servant is warned. If you disobey, you're in trouble. But no, he says, in keeping them, and there is great reward. So look at the benefits. Restore the soul. Make wise the simple. Rejoice the heart. Enlighten the eyes. There's a sense of cleanness. Um, then there's great reward. That's a lot. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Um, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That is a prayer that I pray every, every single time before I ever teach the word of God. So that, verses 7 through 14, is special revelation. So there's special revelation, and there's general revelation. In other words... General revelation can only tell us that God exists, that he's the God of order and design. Special revelation is where he communicates to us. That's how we find out that he's personal. That's how we find out about what we're all about, what he, what he has for us, reward, etc. That's a very important theological concept, general revelation and special revelation. Everything that we know about God is because it is revealed to, to us. That is yet another aspect of his grace. So just the fact we, we take that for granted. But the word you have on your desk right there is, is a is a aspect of love. It is an aspect, it's a tangible aspect of his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his love, his redemption, his eternal plan for us. It's right here. We just we look at it as a book. But we often don't think, oh my gosh, this is your special revelation to me. This is your way of, of inviting me into your world and communicating with me. And it's also your way of enabling me to communicate back to you. How would I talk to God if he didn't talk to me first? How would I talk to God if he didn't reveal something about himself to me? But then how could I be sure of a relationship with him if, there was, if this thing was full of error? then that would point to something about him that his character is deficient. You see how important the inerrancy and the infallibility and the inspiration of Scripture and the authority of Scripture are because it gives us foundation for our salvation. It gives us a foundation for assurance of eternal life. Everything we talk about, we're sure about because the word of the Lord is tried and tested. Are there difficulties in Scripture? Yes. Are there contradictions in Scripture? Nowhere. I've been studying this thing mm -hmm. voraciously now for mm -hmm. since 1981, and and I've been able to uh, explain just about every Bible difficulty there is, mm -hmm. but I'm still working on more. Paragraph number seven. One Old Testament scholar concludes: If the nature of man can be defined, um, uh, maybe I should skip over the rest of this stuff. Yeah. Wait a minute, I didn't even do it. I'm just testing you. I was like, I'm going to go ahead and like, yeah. I'm like, wait, did I just say that? Did we all just fall asleep? Exactly. I was like, what? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and 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 go the book of Genesis gives mm -hmm. us our historical point of reference mm -hmm. from which all subsequent revelation proceeds. That's why Genesis is important, hence it's why the Old Testament is important. In the book of Genesis, all the major themes of the Bible have their origin. All the major themes of the Bible have their origin. What is it? Major themes. All the 
major themes of the Bible have their origin starting with grace and redemption. It's right there at the very beginning. It's not a New Testament thing. It is a book, paragraph 6, of many beginnings. In it we see God's goodness. We just talked about that, didn't we? So we see God's goodness at the beginning of Genesis, and we see it at the end. No charge for that insight there, by the way. We see his goodness in the creation of all that exists out of nothing. The Hebrew word God created is bara, which means to create out of nothing. Um, in Genesis 1 through 2, with a sixfold repetition of the word good, and then the word very good. The background, in part, for Psalm 118, verses 1 through 3, where he says, um, uh, that's a memory verse that I can't remember right now. Um, anyway, Psalm 118 talks about his goodness, verses 1 through 3. Uh, we see the Garden of Eden, or paradise, which God gave to man, Genesis 1 through 3. Man's removal from Eden must be seen as so tragic that God's grace and mercy must be magnified greatly in his plan to bring his redeemed people into the restored Eden. I already mm -hmm. alluded to that. Revelation 21, 22, and Romans 8, 18 through 23. Now we're looking at the unity of Scripture. That's something that we mentioned, or I mentioned a lot last week. Um, Henry, Henry wasn't able to come last week. So one of the other things, my responsibility, I feel like I need to do is make it really clear that there's the unity of the Bible how the New Testament depends upon the Old Testament, and vice versa. There's a unity of the Bible. Well, now we just saw the big picture of salvation in history, that what God created at the beginning, sin spoiled, God is going to renew, and you see that emphasis in Revelation looking back at Genesis. I dare say John, with the book of Revelation, would not have unhitched from the Old Testament. <laughs> Get my point. So I, I know I'm beating you know, up on any standard. He defends himself big time on that. Well, Did you see the latest article where he comes out and he defends himself? No, I didn't see that. That CBN interviewed him and he, he takes a different stand. I didn't say that. Yeah, Not but it's in a book. See that? It's yeah. in a book. That's the thing. He can, he can backtrack all he wants. But hey, if he humbles himself...